Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. I'm James Hay, KEM for AHDB Dairy. And tonight I'm joined by Jamie Robertson. Uh, Jamie, good evening to you. Good evening, James. I'm very pleased that you can't see me, but I'm very pleased if you can hear me right. We've got the sound sorted out in the end. Um, so uh, thanks for that, Jamie. We'll come back to you in, in just a moment. But uh, to everyone uh, listening to us tonight, thanks very much for joining us, especially if you're watching live. Uh, we've got a lot of people that have joined us live tonight. So I'm hoping that we'll have lots of questions and lots of discussion as we go through tonight's webinar. But uh, just before we make a start with tonight's topic, I'd like to just run through some housekeeping. Uh, everyone's muted to avoid any sound interference and we'll be recording this webinar so that it'll be available for you to watch on YouTube, where you can also find previous recordings of other AHDB webinars too. For those of you that are listening on this recording uh, on YouTube, please do hit subscribe for more from AHDB Dairy digital channels and also follow us on social media, especially on our new account on Instagram. There's going to be an email sent out to everyone who's registered for this tonight with any resources that we might mention. And I encourage you to complete the survey along with these, uh, this link to help us improve our future events. For those of you listening that got in quickly to register for tonight's webinar, you might have received a delicate pack from us in the post. And this will include a thermometer, a calf thermometer, our new calf housing guide, and a calf health scorecard. Now, if you didn't receive one of these packs, but would like one, um, we'll be referring to the housing guides uh, tonight, and that can be ordered uh, via the AHDB website. Please send any questions that you might have in, and I'll ask Jamie throughout the evening. And I'll also make sure that we've got some Q&A time at the end, just to mop up any questions that we don't get round to. Any questions that you have submitted, um, they can be, uh, you, you can submit them by clicking on the arrow in the orange box at the top right hand side of your screen. Um, that's if you're watching on a PC or a laptop. If you're watching on a uh, phone, then there's a questions box just to the bottom of the screen. And I want to reassure you that other delegates attending this meeting can't see the questions that you submit. So on to tonight's topic the role of housing in pneumonia prevention. Um, tonight's webinar is one of a series of calf pneumonia webinars that AHDB are holding throughout November, featuring industry export, experts and farmers uh, to help us learn how to prevent the disease, reduce costs and lessen the impact on your business. Pneumonia is one of the most significant diseases affecting calves and it costs the UK cattle industry an estimated £50 million a year. Bovine respiratory disease, BRD or, or pneumonia, usually occurs in young house calves, either reared as dairy replacements or in beef systems. So it makes perfect sense that tonight we should be focusing uh, on calf house, improving calf housing as part of this series of pneumonia prevention. And who better to speak to us on this topic than none other than the housing guru himself, Jamie Robertson. Now, first of all, thanks, Jamie, for coming out of retirement for us tonight. I'm sure that we're going to learn a lot and you're always uh, good for entertainment value. But I believe that you've got some stiff competition as it's the quarterfinal of the Great British Bake Off tonight. And it's also party week. So no pressure there, Jamie. <laughs> All good. We can, we're, we're always prepared to take on uh, long odds, aren't we, James? Long odds. That's it. That's it. So I, I will just explain to everyone listening that um, uh, we had a bit of trouble with your sound and we found that it only worked with your camera off. So uh, you were very happy about that. But uh, apologies, you're not going to be able to see Jamie's face tonight. But um, I'll pass over to you, Jamie. Lovely, thank you very much. Well, at least that we start off for a positive for everybody that's watching. You don't have to see my ugly mug. Um, but thank you very much, as ever. Um, you, we go back a long, long way working on these things together, and um, it's always a pleasure. So thank you very much. But um, yeah, I've, as a as a young man doing doing, doing my job, I was uh, I'm working um, with pigs and poultry before I got to calves and respiratory disease. Um, it was interesting 
to note that uh, the impact of the environment on respiratory disease in young cattle was you followed a fairly typical pattern. And of course, back then, with so many cattle kept outside in the summer, we tended to get a bit of a train crash every autumn when cattle were put inside and young stock were put inside. And um, you know, I think there's there's a lot I learned very greatly gratefully from working with the pig and poultry industries and from my peers up in Aberdeen. Um, but anyway, we'll take a run through. Um, the, the layout of uh, what we're going to do over the next hour or so is um, really just tracking what has come out in the new AHDB um, calf housing guide. Um, a lot of information there, I must mention Ian Onstat, um, who kept me right to sort of get some of the stuff material together. Um, but anyway, would, very briefly going to touch on legislation market requirements. Um, it's quite interesting how both of those things are usually driven um, by an understanding of what's going wrong. Um, it's like health and safety legislation tends to come at us some you know, after numerous people have fallen off a roof or, or broken their fingers um, sticking you know, at machinery. And the same with market requirements. Um, that there was a time when quality assurance didn't exist. Um, and now, depending on who your contract is with, um, there will be specific requirements relevant to housing and relevant to young stock. So I'm just going to touch on that, but only briefly, because you can, I expect you can all read, so you can go and find it out for yourself. Then run through the design questions. Um, for me, the interesting thing is that actually across all species, um, young stock, older stock, um, the basics, that's all you get from me, nothing fancy. Um, the rules are all the same and they don't move. Um, and I think in terms of understanding calf pneumonia, um, it's a complex issue, we know that. Um, there's a variety of viruses out there, you'll have other webinars about that. There's secondary infections from bacteria, um, there's a question of immune status, going back obviously starting with the dam and then colostrum blah 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 blah. one of the comments I would make to the industry and to the veterinary profession is that actually the one bit that doesn't move in all the complexity of managing animals and chronic disease the one thing that doesn't move is a building and in fact we can understand a lot about a building even without any animals inside it and there's certain aspects of a building we can look at visited in June and I have a pretty good idea of how well it may or may not function next January. Um, the weather, although it's, we think of it as unpredictable, that's nonsense. Funny enough, it always gets cold and damp in the autumn um, and the correlation with the incidence of respiratory disease in young cattle and autumn weather is pretty tight. So we'll run through that a very briefly for me today, um, just touch on the environmental factors because there's a webinar tomorrow which is going to be focused entirely on that. Um, that's really sort of my bread and butter, how the environment interacts with the physiology of an animal, but also how the weather interacts with the longevity of respiratory pathogens outside the host. Um, this is something I think that gets ignored a lot. We'll move on, housing layout and construction. Um, there's no such thing as you a, a system that's not good for calves. There'll be the system in the wrong place or a system that is not put together properly. Um, and the advantage of looking at sort of these broader pictures is that it doesn't matter whether you're, you're running a, um, a hut system or a fancy new A-frame shed with ventilation, the rules are all the same. Running through to feeding, um, again, I think that for me, labor has always been part of it is something we need to incorporate into our design processes. Um, and it, in many ways, it's got even more important because we have less and less labor and good people are hard to hang on to. And to me, that's almost like that's the next place for us to go in the development of our systems is to invest more money in the design aspects that make people be able to do their jobs better. I'll finish up with something fairly radical um, and a lose-lose situation from my point of view. 
um, system cost considerations. Um, and I think there'll, there'll be plenty there for us to stir us up, um, see what what's the value of these different systems, and then finishing off a little bit on um, grants and, and indicators of support. So that's really it. So we'll move on to legislation. Um, the, the thing here is that, as I said, I am not, this is the only slide. <laughs> so we're, I'm not gonna bog you down, um, especially when you could be at Bake Off instead. Um, one of the things I find very interesting and, and surprising, um, I'm not a specialist, I'm an animal health man, but um, it's quite interesting how the likes of Red Tractor or your relevant quality assurance contains quite an amount of ballpark information um, as to what is allowable and what your targets are. Um, and certainly, um, if you're looking towards a new build, um, I would always encourage people to have a look at you there further down the supply chain. You know, if you were thinking to go for one of the more sort of prestige uh, suppliers, then make make sure you've an idea of um, where they stand on issues like um, feeding or stocking density um, would be uh, prime examples um, because there's no point spending money today to find out in five years time that you don't have enough feed space per animal, um, et cetera, et cetera. It would be time well spent. I've just picked out, out three issues um, before moving on. One is that we don't see a lot of people doing it now, but feeding once a day um, physiologically doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense in growth rates, and it's certainly not the best way to get the calf um, to develop a good rumen. Um, but uh, I realize there's maybe some people do it for labor reasons, but the rules are you have to feed twice a day, at least until 28 days of age. Um, quite honestly, if you look at the science, you're nuts not to keep feeding twice a day all the way through to weeding. Um, that's not a discussion I need to take any further. I do understand, of course, that where people are tempted to feed once a day, um, and it's because of a labor issue, then maybe that's that's the sort of design feature that needs to be sorted out, is that how can you actually make it easier to feed you know, one person, feed a certain number of calves twice a day. The water one, um, I'll talk about this until the day I'm gone. Um, Water is required from day zero, and the stats on looking at what people actually do is people's attitude towards feeding water to calves is all over the place. Um, and it's very clear that from the science that actually water is water and milk is food. Um, and again, it's a matter of if people aren't feeding water in the required manner, then I would step back and sort of say it is an extremely important thing to be able to do well. What is going wrong with the system in front of you? And if you're investing in the future, it's something we need to do. Um, in the last slide, sorry, if you wouldn't mind going back. In the last slide, I think there are certain issues that um, I mentioned the other day. Thank you very much. Big, big, deep buckets full of water. Um, they get full of sharn. Um, but you can see on the right hand side there the much smaller, shallower um, water drinker in front of a calf. Um, the whole thing about that is you can monitor, monitor water intake um, and you can do it right, right from birth. Um, and it's a very simple way if you're going to visit calves twice a day to be able to understand um, what their relative health is. It's the quickest way across all species in the Certainly the poultry industry, it's the keenest thing to do to work out um, you, if there's any sickness around in the shed. Um, and on the left hand side there, you know, that's a, a tipping drinker you know, with a bit of protection around it. Um, unfortunately, a calf's mouth is at the same height as its backside um, and getting feces in water is in, almost inevitable in a group pen situation, which is why they need to be accessible. Um, to you, your staff, and they need to be keen. So if you go on to the next slide, we can see that um, this is a set of, uh, um, this is about 250 water samples from farms, courtesy of the lovely people at Athby and Hillsborough, Aaron Brown and Gillian Scully, who runs the Young Stock 
team over there. And what you're looking at there is water taken from bowls inside calf pens, about 250 samples, over 66 dairy farms. And you can see on the left hand side there, the color forms 100 mil. Um, and you can see the low blue column on the left hand side, um, less than 100 color forms, 100 mil. That's where we want to be. The red dotted line is an arbitrary figure that we put in there, which is guidance that we use in the pig industry. But you can see that the same with E. coli on the right hand side there, you know, we're looking at basically 90% or at least 90% of all the water samples we measured have got really, yeah, quite juicy levels of coliforms and E. coli in them. And you do wonder whether that's a good place to start. Um, and I think, again, it's an area whereby um, design is part of the solution. Um, I think we need to be feeding calves smaller quantities of water more regularly um, and in a way in which we can at least clean the water troughs quite easily. But um, I think there's part of the future there. And with scour being such a big problem, um, it's an area whereby this, there's a you know, progress to be made. Having big troughs, maybe not such a good idea. But if you have very small cup drinkers, you could decide to invest in them. Um, they're less, you get a higher flow rate, if you like, through the volume of the, of the drinker. Um, but it's very important to have the flow rate in your system um, well adjusted so that calves don't have, end up hanging around for water. Um, so Jamie, really, that's yeah. just, uh, just come as a, a side. It really doesn't matter what system we're looking at, but that's your know, water in there um, from day zero. And the other thing is, again, the data's quite clear. You need to keep your water drinker, buckets, whatever, you a reasonable different distance away from the dry feed. Um, otherwise, you get a lot of transfer of organic matter from the dry feed into your water source, into your water bucket, and funny enough, it turns into rubbish quite quickly. Jamie, can I just uh, chip in there? Is that okay? Um, Absolutely, go for it all the time. Just an observation, really, on the previous slide, you said about the uh, regulations that we can read them, uh, just to direct people to the AHDB Dairy Housing Guide, uh, where there's a, a summary of the regulations there. Um, and also another observation, uh, one of the levy payers that I've, I've been to recently uh, has been using uh, almost dog bowls um, for them to, to give water to the calves. And they've said that, um, you know, calves are much keener uh, to, to drink out of a dog bowl rather than having to get their head right into a bucket. Uh, so it just backs up really what you were saying. But we, we've got our first question, Jamie, if I can just put it to you. Um, and that is how often should water quality be tested and at how many locations in the system? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> that's brilliant. <clears throat> so dairy units would typically, unless they're on the main supply, be testing water source uh, once a year. You know, you go, goodness me, that's not very frequent. Um, we then go within the farm, what's going on? And a lot of farms probably will have never cleaned their water system um, in terms of delivery around through the different buildings and actually to the drinkers themselves. So. It can turn into a big job, James. And my comment would be is that um, take it as a sort of mid to long term activity, maintenance of the water system. Um, you don't, there's no point spending any money on your water truck and water um, drinkers inside a pen if basically they look as if they're full of sharn. Sharn's the polite word for something with its, you know, ends in T. Um, there's no point. The, the, the relevance is there's far too much debris hanging around in these drinkers and investment in the water system. So I'm coming back and say, if it looks dirty, it is dirty. And you say, well, that's how it's been for 30, 40 years, so we're not going to worry. And I'm sort of saying, yes, and scour has been a problem in tasks for 20, 30 years. So I would actually go back to the comment you have from you, that you made about um, you know, one of the members is that certainly for young stock lower volume drinkers that can be easily cleaned out and emptied um that would be my first target in terms of any investment at all 
um, to spend money on measuring the quality of the water would come further down the line. So quite honestly, if it looks dirty, it is dirty. Consider how you might make it easier to keep it clean. That would be my comment, James. So it's a visual impact rather than a visual assessment, sorry, Jamie, rather than anything more uh, technical than that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, that, again, you know, I, I don't know how <coughs> I see good, the bad, the ugly. I'm sure we all do. Um, it staggers me how often I'll see calves queuing up for water as I see cows queuing up for water. So for me, if you like, um, accessibility would be my first measure. Um, visibility, does it look good or bad, would be my second measure. Um, and, and, and third would be, you know, is there enough water to satisfy the demands of the animals? Um, it, I, I think it's a little bit, it's a bit too frequent that I go onto units um, and calves, calves will queue for water. That's a problem. Yeah. Okay, that's it for questions so far, Jamie. I'll let you carry on. Yeah, well, we roll on to the next slide. And um, one of the, th I mentioned there, space is, is, is coming on, um, is, is one of the things that you, you're told you need 1.6 square meters per calf, or two square meters per calf, or three square meters per calf. Um, the important deal, and I'll come back to it again, is that actually um, there's very little science that proves clearly that you, one, number is better than another. The most important thing across all species is the quality of the space. So if we look at here in terms of design requirements, you know, we know what the animal needs. It needs fresh air. It needs a bit of air movement, but not too much. Um, moisture is the same. Too much moisture is a problem. Um, in our climate, too little moisture is rarely a problem unless it's in the drinker. Temperature, we've got highs and lows. So there are a ballpark um, all these things are measurable, and um, we need to pay attention to that. Um, obviously, food, we've got to get the food to them, and there'll be things like um, adequate feed space, competition at the feed, etc., 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 and also hygiene, um, which I'm pushing forward now as saying that's another measurable um, that can influence an animal's requirements. And then, of course, we have the behavioral needs, which is probably more where. Um, the space issue comes from and you know the 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 data slowly evolves of you know, how much space um there's the new information on 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 um uh putting items into pens to make it more interesting for calves the information on light for calves is very very minimal in which case i tend to say stick to common sense Good daylight is a good idea. So with, with a number of design requirements, doesn't matter what system we're looking at, it, from the animal's point of view, whether they're in a hutch or an igloo or an A-frame building, um, you know, something with curtains on the sides, it really doesn't matter. All these animal requirements stay the same, whichever system it's in. Producers needing something that's financially competent, um, you know, and of course, where we run in air, thing, things might be actually low cost, but if they don't produce a good, steady, sustainable product, um, then they're actually very expensive. At this point, the labor and resource availability, that's the biggie, that's the new one. Um, and we need to make sure that we're spending money um, to help people do the job easier and better. And then the bottom box, um, I'm sorry for the repetition here, but um, you, the society, it isn't, it says, that it will pay for everything wonderful all the time. And the reality is, no, they don't. Um, they need to be presented with products at a reasonable price that fits their idea of welfare. Um, antibiotic aware and environmentally sustainable. And the lovely thing about this is, is that as an industry, we've been looking at these things now for 20, 25 years, haven't we? Um, and it's not a surprise. And I think we can deal with it quite well. Um, running on here. Um, and so it's our last slide, the, the, the broader design requirements. Um, this is from um, the Scottish Farm Buildings Investigation Unit, published in 1976. Um, that's where I cut my teeth when I came back from working overseas in the 80s. Um, and I think there are just a few things that I'll, I'll, I'll just nip through because I realize there's be quite a few people interested in the grants and maybe cracking on. Um, you 
getting some ideas together to put in an application. You don't need a grant to um, really get on with improving calf housing if improvements needed. So I think the things that I see go, uh, they're, they're all on here. So if I start top left at site, um, you need to check you know, how near they are to other buildings. That's a straightforward biosecurity issue. The upwind, downwind of the herd, um, access for machinery, for people, you know, just because you've got a nice wee spot to put a nice small calf building, you think big picture all the time, all the time. And you the degree of exposure um, obviously should have an influence on the type of building you build. Um, soil time and gradient are really get, starting to get quite technical. But the, the point is, is that um, you just sticking things. Um, so I would see a weakness of some of the um, arch space systems when I'm called in to have a look at things that maybe aren't working very well. There's actually nothing wrong with hutches at all. People might hear me slag them off, but it's because the way they're being used. And you know, people will put up hutches because they've got a strip of available concrete. The fact that it's in the wrong place, the concrete drains the wrong way, and it's too exposed is kind of sort of missing the point, apparently. Um, but that's not the case. So those are things that are all important um, in terms of you know, it might cost a little bit more to put up a bit of concrete somewhere else. Um, which takes care of some of the issues like access and exposure. Um, going around the top, um, I'll come back to this again. For me, the housing system, um, I'm always starting on off with um, feeding and panning. I'm not interested in to, uh, the, the walls and the roof until we've designed everything on the ground. Um, how would you want to feed them? What's the group size? And therefore, what's the pen size? How many animals do you have? you're on milk at any one time um, and off you go and um, you to find what's suitable and yeah is it your know, housing period I think there's some interesting challenges for people that are batch carving um, because if you're looking to invest um, your payback period is you know, five or six months a year not 12 months a year um, and that sometimes imp imposes restrictions on cost um, which bottom left hand corner um, again on cost it's obviously an important deal, but what we must keep talking about is value and do investment appraisals. I'll come back to the, that later on. Um, but uh, the comment I made just early in the week in um, Total Dairy Conference, you, you cheap can turn out to be very expensive. And we have experience. We all have experiences of um, buying stuff where we, we, we wish we hadn't bothered, but we bought it because it was appeared to be relatively low cost and it turns out to be expensive. Maintenance, ha, ha, ha. Um, you know, certainly we could go into climatic controlled environment for calves. You know, it was done in the 1960s. Um, we could keep calves in the same way as we keep broiler chickens. The one comment I would make about that is the initial cost is going to be high, but you really need to have an attitude towards maintenance, which is not as common on um, livestock farms as it should be. Um, you know, maintenance is something you know, which it's relevant to drains, it's relevant to every moving part, it's relevant to gates that get harder and harder to work. Um, and in some ways, that's how we design a lot of other structures. Um, we design buildings to be maintained, and it's very important, um, I think, uh, in terms of calf house, that we consider a major factor of maintenance is you know, ability to provide good hygiene um, and design buildings that are easy to clean. Running costs, labour costs, labour costs never going to get less. Um, so really, that's it. We can move on. You know, is it conversion? I mean, you know, just before we do move on, in terms of the age of the animal. Um, what should we be considering? You know, um, I've heard you say before a, a one size fits all isn't appropriate for a, a calf rearing system. So we, we need to be thinking about when the animal grows, what sort of housing that they'll need uh, going forward. So, yeah, do you want to yeah. elaborate? Absolutely. Thank that? you, James. So, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I the issue here is that the evidence just keeps growing exponentially about the value of getting the first few weeks of a dairy calf or heifer calf. But 
be the same with the ball calf, so don't worry about it. The value of getting it right and what we lose by getting it wrong in the first 24 hours, the first week, the first four weeks, etc. And a bit like the way as an industry we spend money in the parlor because that's the other end of the supply chain on the farm. That's where the milk comes out. We spend a lot of money in there trying to make the things slicker, easier, cleaner, nicer for the cows, whatever. And we need to do the same. Now, the issue, as I'll touch on briefly, but will be in the webinar tomorrow, is that a calf on milk is a less robust animal than one that's three, four weeks weaned. And so it seems to me, again, if we look at all this design requirements, you know, we want fairly easy access because the things can't work, walk very far. We cert we want the least amount of exposure. You know, you, you talk, I, I have people that think a calf is something that's 12 months old. No, it's not, not in my head, but something that's 12 months old on a decent diet, you know, you don't need to worry too much about sclerosia apart from the middle of the winter in, side of a cliff by the side of the Atlantic. Um, whereas a young calf exposure is a major deal. Um, and I think, you, again, you look at labor, um, you putting feed in front of a, a bunch of sort of six month old heifers, um, you once a day from a feeder wagon and then checking them once a day visually, you know, the labor requirements low. Um, so I think that for me, the benefit of investing in uh, infrastructure for the milk-fed calf plus two weeks. So you keep them there during, when you wean them, again, this is to do with stress management. Ideally, you want enough space. Um, if you're gonna keep them on milk for, for eight weeks, um, keep them within the same space um, when they go completely weaned. And then, James, when they go into the next space, let's think about it. You know, there's no milk being floated about. Everything's on a dry on a, on a dry diet or drier diet. Um, they're on ad lib feeding, same on straw. Um, the lower critical temperature will be you know, in in minus minus five minus ten degrees centigrade. Um, I think the most important thing about the design of moving from that first phase to the second phase is to get the size of pens balanced up. So you can move animals, get the flow of animals right, so that when you're weaning animals and putting them into, uh, um, you, if you like, the second stage housing, which can be a lot more simple, completely naturally ventilated, um, doesn't have to have very sophisticated structures to it. Um, you just the one thing I would say is make sure that the groups you can manage group sizes, um, you know, without constantly putting newly weaned calves into a group that's five animals then eight animals and 12 animals and 15 animals um because that provides a stress that it doesn't want so um yeah i'm t i'm going to predominantly talk about um for me a calf is something that drinks milk um plus a couple of weeks james yeah that's fantastic thanks jb so as we go on, so we, we, we pocket all up these design requirements and we'll move on on the slides. Um, and again, this is interestingly enough, James, this is exactly the same set of criteria for milk fed calves as they are for something that's weaned and weighing 200 kilos. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm sorry, I've it's boring. I've talked about this so many times. I'm kind of going, actually, this is the uh, another five freedoms, the five environmental factors. Um, and basically, it, if I'm looking at a system for any livestock and the environment, as in the building, is holding health and productivity back, then it's one or more of these five things here. Um, hygiene, and my experience of people look after young stock, they spend quite a bit of time keeping things as clean as they can, and I come straight back to design. I think the problem here is you've got too many buildings that are actually extremely difficult to clean and keep cleanable. Moisture control, this is a simple one. In the UK, we have far more respiratory disease um, in cattle, in young cattle, 
um, at certain times of the year than many other parts of the world that have you know, a lot of dairy cattle, beef cattle, and the, the problem is our climate. We're a maritime climate, we've got a high levels of humidity and moisture control. You won't get on top of PRD in young calves in spite of good colostrum management, good vaccine management, until you get better control within the calf house on moisture. The problem is too much moisture floating about, and that comes down to drains, floors, and ventilation, um, and we'll go on to that. Fresh air, you could say that's another hygiene aspect. Um, people arguing about oules down in London and everything else. You, these people need a good, no, I, 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 I'm sorry. Um, you know, the, the issue here is that when you look at respiratory disease in mammals, that includes humans and it includes calves, is that actually dirty air requires the immune system focused on the respiratory tract to deal with what's going on. So various items like to develop a system because you've got six or a thousand cows that you end up having a very large calf house. So you end up bedding up using a straw shopper. For me, that I would just out, outlaw it. It doesn't work um, because there might not be pathogens coming out of that uh, straw, you know, the long straw, but the, the particulate burden, the aerosols in the air, basically take up the immune capacity of the respiratory system and um, leave plenty of opportunity for any viruses and bacteria um, to attack the respiratory system. So fresh air is a vital part of managing respiratory health. We can talk about the so, gases. Jamie, yep. with that in mind, what would be your view on sort of artificial ventilation systems, the air tube uh, through the um, through the calf housing? Yeah, I think um, if a building or structure is, you know, let's say, only five meters wide, um, you know, again, you go back to the, the beauty of the hutches, hutch-based systems, the igloos, some of those, um, you know, like the high health units, um, they kind of don't need a, a mechanical ventilation system because you know, there's no cow's, cow's nose more than you know, three or four meters from the outdoor air. Now, stick them in the middle of London and they'll get respiratory disease um, because of all the other, this, then they won't be breathing fresh air. But on the farm level, that's fine, it, it'll all work. Once you get into mechanical ventilation, um, in you basically steel steel and concrete buildings, um, you have an absolute requirement for an, a, an element of mechanical ventilation um, because you don't get a stack effect. So the wind will ventilate a building quite nicely, and we'll come on to that in a little while. You know, the wind blows 90% of the time or more. Um, but you know, if you've got a building with fresh air, can get out of it on all four walls, all well and good. But of course, in our farms. Many of them don't. They've got something beside it. They've got a silage bit beside it. Um, and the, by far the sort of most sustainable way of driving you clean air into a building, a calf building, is a fan and a duct system. The proviso is, huh, you need to look after it. What a surprise. You know, after a year, it's probably full of dirt again and it needs to be cleaned. Um, you know, this is typical. So in the pig and poultry industry, that's what you do. So, yep. James, the ve mechanical ventilation is part of the solution um, once you step away from hutches and it goes. We then go on to air speed, no drafts at animal height. And of course, this is the conflict. We want fresh air, we don't want a draft. And that comes down to design, and we'll talk about that. And, and then temperature, well, you know, in Britain, all calves born you know, in, the, in the winter months in the first week of life, they're all below their lower critical temperature. Um, it is what it is. We've done a fantastic job of feeding them better, um, which is brilliant. Um, colostrum management is a massive help because of the nutrient quality of that early nutrition. Um, helps keep them warm. It's very simple, people. Um, get a calf jacket on them. You know, that's a bit of a laugh, but it works a treat. Um, but the whole point is Just, that... Uh you made a couple of really good points there jamie and i don't want to 
just sort of gloss over them. Cluster management, you mentioned is important, so just remind us um, what we should be doing. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about buildings. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, sorry. I think again, if I can go straight to the fact that you, the evidence of the value of colostrum, you, I'm, I've been around a long time now. I learned it in the 1970s. So the value has never got less. It just keeps getting more. The importance is to deliver you know, the right quality, right amount at the right time. Um, I think, James, you're probably better placed than me to see you know, uh, what the current advice I is. Was say, probably for the um, interest of time, we've got some really good clips on our AHDB dairy youtube channel uh about clostrum quality and how to administer it as well uh yeah. so uh, do do have a look at that but uh, the other thing that you mentioned jamie um was uh, jackets what would be your protocol with jackets um when to put them on when to take them off right the whole thing all we're doing here all the time and that will bring me back to the buildings is we're managing thermal dynamics where does the energy go the calf keeps itself warm on the basis of what it eats and the rate at which it loses heat from its body depends on the dry bed uh the wind uh the materials around it so in terms of jackets then um if i was working for you or you were working for me we would we'd have started about a month ago and sort of said right keep a policy simple you every calf born you from mid October onwards is going to get a jacket on it. Um, just don't bother about you have a nice warm day in October. We need deliverable, sustainable systems. The jacket goes on and it stays on for three to four weeks. No more. I see people, uh, calves, calves wearing jackets, calves will be eight weeks old. It doesn't need that jacket. And the reason for that is that lower critical temperature. You know, which is in the region of 15 degrees centigrade. There you are, the bottom of the slide here. You know, that's that's day zero. You know, an average calf with average average birth, average everything. You know, big strong calf, it might be 10 degrees centigrade. But the, just keep it simple. The lower critical temperature will drop by half a degree centigrade a day. Do the maths. After 30 days, the lower critical temperature is going to be around freezing point. And for most parts of Britain and most months of the year, you know, it doesn't need a jacket. So keep it simple. If you've got a jacket on a calf more than five weeks old and a calf on your farm that is you know, in the first week of life without a jacket, your system's wrong. Get the jackets on them young, take them off three to four weeks of age. Um, but amongst the group of calves, if one of them at three to four weeks of age is struggling a bit it's not eating properly it's got a bit of brd keep the jacket on the same again if you've got enough jackets and there's a vicious cold spell coming in you're in cornwall in november and there's some gales howling around the buildings are quite open keep the jacket on but keep it simple and the final point is when you take that jacket off wash it my advice to anybody and all the vets is do not advise any of your clients to use jackets if they won't wash them End of story. And also to um, make sure that they're properly dry after they've been washed as well, Jamie. Before they... <laughs> yeah, it's quite handy. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> absolutely, and, and and only only buy jackets that are breathable. And we then move on to you know, we've known for a long time um, about calves, and they are cold. We know they're cold, and then we move on to materials. I mean, this 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 kind of thing kind of breaks my heart. Look at Look at what somebody's done here. Absolutely fabulous. You know, they've got what's called a covered open ridge on the top there. You know, that's got an outlet in the roof. It's got natural light coming in. Serious amount of money being spent here. Um, slatted bit along the, along the front here, um, so you put, you know, which is not illegal. Um, a big bedded area around the back here, but can, and it's got... Um, Big wide openings about to put curtains in. This is somebody investing a lot of money, but can you imagine how cold it is in here? It will be absolutely Baltic all winter. Um, and you, it's a huge amount of space, concrete and steel, not known for its warmth. So I think I understand why people do this, but 
there's better ways. I would, you know, the, the volume doesn't help because to keep air clean, we need to change all the air in a building. So the higher the volume, the more air volume we have to shift. Um, and you, all that concrete kind of, you know, would you like to sleep in there for the, you know, a couple of nights? Jesus, not myself. So I think. It comes back to the on the on the legal side about um, space. You know, we should have so many square meters per car. The most important thing about space is the quality of the space. You know, you can see here the calves here in terms of the building floor area are going to have you know four or five square meters per car. Um, it doesn't benefit them. They'd be better off at two. But we'll move on. So space quality goes together. In terms of design of all your systems, I think this is a major issue that there are too many premises. Um, you need to clean. A lot of people don't seem to realize this. You need to clean your, your pen or your system before you put new animals in. And one of the problems we have in design is that a lot of them aren't cleanable. It's quite simple. Um, Basically, what I'm saying here, that the science again is very clear, is that if you just take the muck out, throw a bit of disinfectant around, and then put clean straw on top, then that's why you don't get rid of things like crypto. Um, it's certainly in terms of, if you look at things like Mycoplasma bovis, um, in, in terms of any cattle system, you know, it, it survives quite happily, 40, 50 days outside the host in a slightly damp environment. So I think it's very important that when you look at a system, you have to say, how am I going to, when I get a bat, a, that pen of calves leaves, you know, at eight, nine, after eight, nine weeks, what are you going to do? Are you going to drag the straw out, throw some straw in and get the next lot of calves in as fast as you can, which is common, I'm sorry, or am I going to have a system where I've got enough time to get in and clean it out and you'll have your pinch points that's normal you know even the broiler industry has pinch points where you know at which point we do things like we don't throw water about because if we throw water about washing a pen out we don't have enough time to get it dry which you mentioned james um you know uh and things like crypto and mycoplasma you will just love a bit of cold moisture just to keep themselves alive until you put the next animal in and so we will use dry disinfectants um, at times of the year when it's not easy to clean but the point is I'm talking about things at the system level so yeah if you go on and look at the feeders um, and it's just again these things are difficult to clean they're difficult to clean if you don't have enough time which is back to labor but also if you don't have enough resources so cleaning something like this is an absolute nightmare but the industry is really good at working things out for themselves. Um, you know, there's, there's enough kit lying around the average dairy farm for a cost of no nothing for materials um, to put you know, at least be able to soak one of these things, chuck something in and get it soaked. Um, so that when you come to wash it out, it's easier to get it clean. And I'm looking up the top there. Again, this is um, the people up at Athby, you know, on the on the dairy farms. You know, we're measuring in feeding equipment, so we've looked at drinking water, but you can see when we talk about total viable counts, that's TVC as a hygiene indicator, it's just saying your know, background bacteria that will grow at sort of you know, our temperatures. Um, and you can see over there on the right hand side, this is called colony forming units per mill. You know, there's not much much water in the mill, but you can see, you know, the dirtiest example we had had over eight and a half thousand million viable particles <laughs> in a in a mill of swab coming out of a feeding equipment. You know, and probably the same sample had you know, eight 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 thousand million viable coliforms. Basically, excuse me, it's got shit in it big time, um, and this is after being used. So. I think that in our terms of our systems that we're talking about, you want to talk about buildings, James, but I think the building is just you know, the, the four walls and the roof. What I'm looking at is the system which includes the building. And I think one of the problems of our buildings is they're not set up 
to be cleanable or to provide people with the space to do something as straightforward as clean up either. So we'll crack on. Yeah, I think you've got yeah. somebody listening, Jamie, that speaks your language. It's a, an observation, not a question so much, but uh, I, I won't read it out word for word because I've asked you not to swear, so I won't myself. Uh, but disinfected muck is still muck and that the uses, use of um, detergent is important. So just backing up what you're, you're saying, Jamie. Um, just to remind everyone before we do move on, uh, if you have got any questions, uh, then just submit them in the questions box and I'll I'll get to asking them to Jamie. But back over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, we'll just give that for five seconds and then move on to the next slide. I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't, you know, I have full empathy, full empathy with you know, farming systems where this is what you've got, you know, but you can imagine you get mycoplasma or crypto in here, you know, and, um, and you look at look at how tight it is on the walls. If you start getting respiratory diseases in here, you know, you'll be chasing it around for the rest of your life. Um, you know, throwing, you'll need all the vaccines you can get. But um, I think it's an area whereby I believe the industry can invest in itself, in its people to do the job properly. You know, that's that's just sheer hard work I'm looking at in that picture. So we'll kind of move on. So we'll start look at different systems then. Um, I'm going to just you. My only point about that is that um, when I started working on respiratory disease in, in in cattle, we were actually also because that's our job. We were looking at what was on the farm, what's on the farms anyway, what bacteria and viruses are circulating, and this is just you know, a list of data um, you, of sorry of what was on all those dairy farms in Northern Ireland and the Opti House project. And you can see my point my point is is that um, these young animals with their budding immune system and all the other things that are going on in their lives. There's a lot of things floating around and we don't have and shouldn't aspire at the moment certainly not the moment in producing calf systems where everything's clean. You, we are so far away from that, we shouldn't even pretend to, to get there. We, we should work at it, keep going. But I think it's you, we need to keep going at the things we know we can do, like you know, providing clean water, providing materials that are cleanable. Um, as I said, yeah, don't throw disinfectant or dirt because it'll stay dirt. Um, and I think we can see down the bottom of there, you know, you know, people being kept away from the calf house. You know, visitors prevented access. Um, foot dip present. You know that that foot dip present, as long of course it's foot dip that isn't itself full of dirt. Um, you know, these things are going to start appearing on farms, and that's all good. Um, but we need the resources to do. It. So we'll move um, on again. Um, Jamie, just a question about disinfection routine. If um, if you're not able to to wash the pens or wash the um, unit where the carbs have been, um, could heat be used? Uh, so I guess they're, they're talking about those uh, flamethrowers, those weed burners. Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we'll go, we'll do, do the simple things first. As, as somebody beautifully pointed out, the first thing to do is get rid of the organic matter, and a lot of people don't. So you need to get rid of the organic matter. So that's an extra five minutes. Get off the mat, bro. Get decent, you know, have decent hand tools. Get rid of it as much as you can. You then do the next bit, which is in terms of design and new builds. Make sure that this floor has a bit of slope on it. So when you do throw some water about, it drains where you want it to. Yeah. So you can chase after it, get a squeegee after it, help the drying process. Um, and thereafter, you apply your disinfectant. But that might be a dry disinfectant. Just use some slate lime. You know, it's been used for you know, 150 years, and it's good stuff. What, where you're left with sort of rubble floors, um, you know, old buildings. You know, 100 years ago, um, some of these old buildings can be very useful spaces for young calves. Um, yeah, use weed burners. Um, we use them in in the pig industry up here in northeast Scotland. Some of these big old beef sheds. 
you know, with rubble floors, you can't get all the dirt out of them. Um, you, you, but what we will do is we'll use use weed burners. But um, I, for me, always do do the do the basic things first, though, before we start burning stuff down, James. <laughs> Be too dangerous. Um, and also, just, there's a couple of questions just coming on this. Um, in terms of a routine, Jamie, if um, somebody's uh, got calves and young stock to feed, um, would you recommend that they perhaps do the milk calves first, the younger uh, calves in the herd, before they move on to uh, the older young stock um, to, I, I guess, to prevent the younger ones being exposed to any challenges? Yeah, I mean, great idea. Absolutely. You would tend to do that. Um, yeah, we also know that what the calf likes is just like you young any any animal including the humans they like routine they like consistency um you know and if the calves are fed first you know you've got the hot water you've mixed up the powder your routine is is is, is godliness um you know and obviously it's the nature of our business that you know, things get in the way and things break and you have to rush off but obviously you if you start with the calf it's like going to the dentist and getting an appointment first thing in the morning you're much more likely to get on the time than if you go in the afternoon so absolutely right i do think um as well that we need to be i need to, people like myself on the outside need to be realistic about the hygiene story but i would go okay twofold i for me i would want two levels of hygiene management on say a calf unit one is the every day let's get on with it this is what we do and i do think that once a year or after a disease you know a scour outbreak or a pneumonia outbreak or something like that we should deep clean and there's a big difference here um and if farms are overstocked they're never going to deep clean but maybe come the summer i'll mention this right at the end here you know calves don't melt um <laughs> they're born to live outside um and actually some of our systems would benefit really just having a four day period where you went in, you cleaned the pipes, you got into the drains, you soaked everything, you killed everything in the building that, that, that you know, um, keep, not the people, but just kill everything that moves, you, you know, do a bit of maintenance and put the animals back in again. So I think routine is good, but start, starting with the youngest, always the same. And, um, and the, the sick, sick pen as an ad, tag on on the side. Right, so we'll yeah. move on here and we go into the bedding. Just one more question, Jamie, before we do move on. Um, what would you recommend for cleaning calf teats, Jamie? So what detergent or disinfectant? Or I remember when we had uh, Sam Ledley over, um, it was more the temperature um, of the water that you were washing in that was, was important to him. Um, if you couldn't put your hands into it, you had to wear gloves, then um, he wants the water really hot. So what, what are your views on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah hot hot water so over 60 degrees that was the deal on the calf jackets if you read the label um you know you you get you get get the muck off anyhow you like but then over 60 degrees kills a lot of stuff people um you know and the same with the the respiratory viruses the crypto and the majority of the pathogens you're dealing with that cause scour so six degrees centigrade that's that is a treat um again I've, i'm going to come on to that right at the end i, th I think well i'll preempt it here i think that you, the dairy industry here we're going 2024 the year of the calf kitchen i think for the money the relatively small amount of money required in capital to provide a facility in the bay of a building where you can get water at 60 degrees when you need it, you know, where you can dunk Wiredale feeders to have a soak, um, where things, once you wash them, you can hang them on the wall as opposed to on the floor, um, you know, the dirty floor where they came from, where the place was, you know, everything where you needed to help people do their job quickly and efficiently. That's part of, that's part of your future. It's going to come. Um, I think with teats, the, uh, I mean, the big lift that we had, you know, automatic car feeders. Again, the data on what people do with these things is absolutely bonkers. 
Um, but some people do a fabulous job. So to answer your question there, in terms of teats, calf teats, um, it was rough to start with, but when we saw mycoplasma going around calf rearing units, um, that when we suggested, okay, you need two teats on every machine, one's on the machine and another's on the little bucket on the side of the machine, just a little you know, half litre container, you know, per, per acetic acid solution in it, um, they, would say that they would see a pen of cars lifting within three days. Makes a lot of sense, the logic's easy. Um, Milton's solution um, is less aggressive. You know, so in terms of teats, teat management, teat hygiene, ah, definitely worth it. The, the evidence in the, it, you know, we get from calf rearers is that you know, um, washing teats on a regular basis is well worthwhile. Thanks very much, JB. Cheers. Yeah, and then we're, then we're sort of moving on, and again, you can see here we haven't even <laughs> buildings, we haven't even really mentioned buildings, but no, we're talking about the built environment. This again, picture shows tells a story. You know, there'll be um, yeah, what are we looking at? 250 samples uh, uh, from the dairy units in Northern Ireland. They're, they're no different to, to here, really. Um, the red line is um, the dry matter of the straw. So we would like our dry matter of bedding to be above 70%. And see quite a lot of them are. We can see quite a lot of them are not. Um, and again, big numbers. People do mostly a very good job in, in, in keeping bedding in, in, in fairly clean conditions. Um, you can see the minimums, the median in, in, in the middle there. These figures are well but within target set in the literature so most people are doing a good job um, um, but there's obviously everybody has a little bit of flexibility to improve um, for me the deal is um, that actually the important deal here mostly is the floor so in terms of buildings and systems we need slopes on floors so that um, yeah perfect you know that things drain properly and Again, you might not like it, and people that lay floors don't like it at all. Well, I would just say, send them around to me, and I'll give them a good kick in. We need a one in 20 slope underneath straw to get it to drain. Now, the advantage, even is, and um, when we come to costumes, we've added a cost. You know, people will charge you more because they don't want to lay a one in 20 slope on the floor. It's more hassle, more time, therefore, it costs you more. But imagine how much labor it saves you. Imagine how much straw it saves you over a 20-year lifetime. Um, and again, this is from 1976. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. And obviously, you big pens, you, you can't have a 1 in 20 slope in a pen that's much more than about 7 meters long. Um, that's about as far as we go. Um, but the point is, why? how many people are cleaning out pens of calves before they're finished? being in that pen, you know, every two, three weeks. So I have to clean it out every two, three weeks. I'm sort of going, really? Is that, do you enjoy doing that? Do the calves enjoy doing that? Does your cost of straw enjoy that? You know, we should be designing systems that work on a batch basis. Um, and, you know, I realize that people have got these, you know, the demands, they've got more and more cows and they end up with more and more calves and they want bigger and bigger pens. And I just sort of say, well, actually, guys, I think we need to have a little bit of a look at the detail um, and where we put the drains, the slope on the floors. We need a dry bed. The reason, James, we need a dry bed is that, of course, they lie down a lot. Um, and if you lie in a damp bed, then you will lose energy to that bed um, and you won't grow as fast. Quite simple. And you put the other thing about an animal being physiologically cold, which lying on a damp bed will, will make it, is that it actually also is immunosuppressive. So it has a direct impact on the ability of the animal to fight incoming disease, the most prevalent of which for a young calf is respiratory disease. So, you know, it, it, it's directly related to the amount of respiratory disease we see. It's one of the factors anyway, James. But we'll move on. But, is there a, 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 an optimal group size that you can have when rearing calves? Okay. Um, if we accept that science like politics is not perfect, uh -huh. um, what 
the current information from around the world that I can get, I'm about a year out of touch. But about up, up until a year ago, I looked at everything in the in the you know, was readable in the world. We're talking about the argument would be it's somewhere between six and ten calves in a group. Okay. Now, whereas you sort of say, well, twenty to thirty, you uh, the issue with twenty to thirty is that it's not that it doesn't work. That's so we have to be very careful how people interpret what we're saying here, James. But you know. Optimum with everything else being good, it looks like six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, but possibly one of the reasons for that being a geek is that well, you've got to have one hell of an output to be able to have pens of 20 to 30 calves all out of the same herd, i.e., the same genetic background, the same biome background, the same pathogen background that also are of a very similar age and physical capability. So it kind of stretches the point a little bit, but certainly in you, everything else being as variable as it is, you know, the smaller pen size um, seems to be the one that you, under a variety of different in your weather conditions and that produces quite well. But that is absolutely not to say that pens of 20, 25 can't made to be worked very well. So the important thing is here, James, we're coming back back to um, in a perfect world, which doesn't exist, you know, these smaller groups, you um, are probably better off. But the important thing is the quality of the space. That's all. Yeah, everything needs to so be ordered before. This is the wrong picture, so you can just press the button on that. <laughs> yeah, put the wrong picture in. On, Jamie, just before we do move on, one more uh, question about floor design and uh, about drains. So, how frequently would you have drains under bedded areas, and what type of drain would you have? Okay, absolutely great. So, um, some people would argue. To, if you've got plenty of bedding and, and sort of the days, you know, where you could get hold of sand or get hold of wood chip or something like that, that actually what you want to do is um, have a level floor and bed it well, and then all the urine stays in the bed and then you muck it out every so often. But remember, that's from an era a long time before we started feeding six, eight, ten litres a day to calves. Yep, so there's a, a massive increase in the amount of liquid going into our calf systems. So what are we going to do? The one in 20 slope, at the bottom of the one in 20 slope, you need a channel drain. If the if if you at the bottom of the slope, but you're still in inside the pen, then um, what are they called? Gatic drains. You'll see them in car parks and things like that, but basically the drain runs underneath the floor and there's a slot which liquid acquires in and it goes into. And yeah, it gets uh, straw in it, but the point is it's the bottom of the slope. You Liquor will go into it. Um, I think the Irish are a bit in front of us in, in their dairy sector and cattle sector on this. I think probably because they don't have as much straw. Um, they're kind of a bit more advanced than we are on drains. But um, the thing is, if a drain crosses through pens, the important thing is it must be under the floor. Yep, because otherwise we'll just spread disease. So more conventionally, like in a building like this, um, you, you'll have a channel drain immediately outside the pen. Um, um, as I said, the, the, what, a gatic drain is basically embedded in the floor and has quite a narrow entrance to the top. If you do that, you need to be able to flush it because just like everything else in life, if it can block, it will. Um, but otherwise, simple channel drain drains, four inch square, you know, 100 mil, something like that. You can put a fancy top on or not put a fancy top on. The thing is, because in the UK we we have to use straw, then Quite honestly, we want the most simple type of drain you can get because it will block. So you need to get that bit easy. 
So, and the other one, I think, I think we, we, sh we could see more of in the United in the UK on the basis that our main dairy areas are all grassland areas. You're all importing straw. It's all costing you money and diesel and everything else. Um, I quite like the systems I see whereby you the front of these pens, uh, um, you've got very shallow slatted tanks. Um, I don't know what you know, people listening in here would think, but you know they're pretty common over in Ireland. Um, they don't do any damage to people to to feet if they're proper, properly done. And the other thing is they are superior to leaving the front third of a pen with no straw on and leaving a damp concrete patch with urine and feces all over it. Um, you know that's not smart at all. You think about it. It makes the building colder. We've now got a cold radiator covering, you know, a third of the floor area. It'll be emitting more ammonia because the urine and the feces mix to release ammonia. Um, it's cold, it's dirty, and it doesn't look fun. Jamie, I know we've still got a lot to cover, but I think this, um, there's a challenge here. Um, just be interested to get your viewpoint on it. Can these drains not spread and harbour bacteria? Um, the the the, sim, the simplest ones um, will be you running outside the pens along the front, um, you know, and uh, yeah, they have the potential um, certainly to to spread bacteria, um, but it's it it it's commonly done and, and successfully done. Um, you know, a channel drain. I'm talking about something that's you know, 100 mil or so outside the front of the pen. Um, you a building like this, you know, where she's got you know, a pile of straw um, for whatever reason, um, you outside in in the in the, in the feet in the feed pass in the middle, you know, that ain't going to work too well. But um, certainly the the gatic drain won't be spreading disease because I said that if you like, you know, you've got a 100 mil or 150 mil pipe running under the floor, just like you know, the, the the street outside your house um but otherwise just you know, a, a simple drain you certainly do not want drains open drains running through the front of pens you know, one to another of course not thanks jamie cheers okay so that's our target you know people are doing it um as i said at total dairy that's that's not it's not my favorite calf house um bit too much tin involved um, and very hot in the summer but but the, the point is there actually tremendous performance coming out of there um, but the thing is you basically it's it's seriously dry um, in a very very wet climate um, very impressive but we'll rattle on through some of the options you know which are in in the handout or um, if you would just just keep 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 pushing the button uh, moving the slides on um, ventilation, you, you know, it's what do people not understand about the link between fresh air and respiratory health? 55% of calf houses had poor distribution of inlets across the building. And if you see down there on, 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 the, on the table, the percentage of required outlet area, 0%, 41% of calf houses. It's actually 92 buildings across 66 farms and this is this is you when I did research on on um, calf pneumonia over 30 years ago the figures were the same and you now have better vaccines and better antibiotics and you still have the same crappy ventilation systems just move on it makes me it makes me unhappy James keep moving Yorkshire board there it is down the bottom right. Builders will sell you a line of boards with gaps between it and call it Yorkshire board. It is not, it is space board and it's not very good in calf housing because the wind and rain comes through the gap. Yorkshire board is what you need. Or some maybe corrugated tin, like having this picture, perfect. You got the corrugated tin. That's a guy built a nice new calf house within a year. It wasn't working because he didn't have the tube ventilation which you see here 
which is getting the air in when the wind does not blow, number one, um, or when the wind stops blowing, which is normal. You know, a nice, you get a week of rain in October in Scotland or November, the place is sodden, and then the storms all die down, the wind drops and everything's full of moisture. And within seven days, there's pneumonia in all our buildings. That's because in calf houses, there is no stack effect from the heat from the bodies to warm this huge space. And so it gets stagnant. So you put the PPTV in, um, it does need to be designed. But the great thing about competent ventilation is it promotes a dry environment. And I said an hour ago, you will not be respiratory disease in calf houses until you get on top of moisture. So next slide, we keep moving on. Um, you know, that, that's, that, that there, you're looking at um, 1,500, 2,000 pounds installed. Um, be good for 80 calves. This is what you put on the roof. Um, you know, a ridge with upstands. This is um, a photograph courtesy of Aaron Brown, who was on the Opti House project. Um, you know, and actually the beauty of them is the upstands, which is the brown bit standing up, funny enough, you know, that's the most important bit of that ventilation because the wind blows more than 90% of the year, rolls up the roof, accelerates when it hits that, that vertical face, gets forced over the gap and creates a negative pressure in that long chimney. So that design of ridge, which will cost you three times as much as something that doesn't work at all, um, but that will actually extract air for more than nine tenths of the year, even if there's only one calf inside the building or 80 calves inside the building. It's a sucking ridge. You know, again, um, that was my boss that, that put that design together you know, 40 years ago. Um, this, is, this is where the smart money is. And in terms of a retrofit on a calf building, um, absolutely ace. 55 pound per linear meter. If your calf house is you know, 24 meters long, that's four, four 20 foot bays. That's a pretty big calf house. You can see 24 meters long. Um, let's make it no 70 pound a, a linear meter fitted. I shouldn't do this, James. So what's that? That's 24, 240 times seven. What are we doing? Planning for 2,000 quid? Yeah, 2,000 pounds for a piece of kit on your calf house that will suck nine tenths of the year for no money. Move on, that's what we should be doing. We need the air out. So when we come to the design of a system, you don't start by buying the building and then work out what you put inside it. You go the other way around. And this is how I do it. People, you know, we talk about things you go, okay, you know, what's the maximum number of calves on milk at any one time plus a couple of weeks worth? I would do the same for the number of calves at the post weaning stage because we're not going to put them all in the same building. My next question is, you know, whether you got, how are you going to feed them singly in groups? Because that will basically dictate pen size. Having got pen size, you know, if you're on a Freedom and Foods contract or something like that, you know, it might be three square meters per calf. So if you're going to feed them in groups of eight, you know, bang, there's 24 square meters. That's how many square meters I need in the pen. It's not, oh, I'll give them some space. We need to smarten up on this stuff. We, no other industry behaves like that. You know, well, we'll just give them lots of space. I'm going, really? That's a lot of concrete to be throwing about for no particular benefit. We need to know how many pens. The pen frontage is dictated by the feeding system. So automatic feeders, you can have a smaller pen frontage. You've got, you once you get to sort of group sizes more than 10, it gets pretty difficult to feed them manually. Um, there's different ways of doing it. But as I said, the pen area, but it's basically depended by, is dictated by what you want. You go back to your original number of calves. I'm going to have 60 on milk at any one time. I want to keep them in batches of 10. Bang, I need six pens, but hang on, I've got to keep them for another couple of weeks and I need enough space so I can clean them. I probably need eight pens. 
and you'll be sitting there listening and saying, Jamie, there's a big difference in cost between eight pens and six pens in the building. And I'm saying, I know that. But the point is, we've got a lot of slack in the industry that will allow us to produce healthy animals at a faster growth rate with less antibiotics and less variable costs and more profit if we get the job right. And this building is going to last you 20 years or more. I think as well, I would be very interested in um, you. I think people need to give a little bit more attention to the layout, as in you. Where's all you mentioned? You people were quite rightly interested in drains. Drainage is one of the hardest things to get right in my experience. But you, know, which way is it going to go? Do I need to build a sump? You know, to get it going in the right direction. But hang on, that's the wrong for the slope of the land. You, know, the the drainage is so important, um, and sometimes that will dictate the layout of the pens, the layout of the floor slopes and drainage channels. And once you've done all that. You go, well, I think I'm going to need you know, a three, four, five, six bay building, blah, 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 blah. It needs to be this wide. And that's how you work out what you need. You know, it might be, well, actually, by this time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using a number of group hutches or a number of igloos. I need to spread them out over that amount of space. But please believe me, the hutches and the igloos, they need a decent floor too. And quite honestly, in the UK, if you have an outside, outside strawed area, why wouldn't you put one kind of roof on it, like the igloo system, you, you, which comes in per cost per car as quite expensive, but it produces calves consistently, and over time you'll get your money back. <coughs> so we'll move on. I'm just conscious of time here. Um, you know, people spending. You know, look at that. That is absolutely cute. Um, somebody doing a lovely job there. Um, an overhead gantry, you know, to make the labour easier. Um, a little hole in the front of the of the, of, of the concrete plinth. The calves are straw bedded but on slats. A little hole so they can put um, the dirty water. Um, you just tip it away before filling up again. My only comment there is it's quite voluminous, be quite a cold building. Um, but people are trying really hard, and some of them doing a fantastic job. You can see how attention to hygiene there will be rewarded, I would think. Next slide. So we're just going to you know, pop through now because that's what we've got. You know, design it for what it wants. You, know, this is the HHU. So we come in here. This, you what I call simple mono pitch doesn't need a ventilation system, but it's got a hole at the back as well. Um, if you make a three-sided solid box, you will get respiratory disease. The fact that it's completely open at the front is irrelevant. You will not get wind-driven ventilation on a three-sided solid box. Um, because it's smaller volume, what was really nice here for me is that um, it's actually got an insulated panel on the roof. It's a lot more expensive per square meter, but calves don't handle variation in ambient temperature very well. Um, small group size, so it's easy to use all in, all out. A bit of added expense at the end there. There's a man gate, sorry, a people gate, calf gate, so you can get in and out, pop, pop animals in, get them out if you need to, making it easier, faster, and more effective. Rattle on. You've seen that already. Yorkshire board at the back there. Single hutches, group hutches. Um, you know, I, I think that um, I, I have trouble with hutches where the pens outside uh, exposed to the open air. I, 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 I don't get it. I think it's very valuable. The great thing about hutch space systems is, of course, you can buy one, two, five, ten. Um, you don't need planning permission. You, they're relatively simple. You can run them all in, all out. They're they're, they're well cleanable. Um, but I just think that um, I would like is the future. They're definitely systems that work very well, but they do need the simple roof, um, if nothing else, for straw costs um, and diffuse pollution and labour. Keep going. We'll just keep pressing the button on these ones. We've had that. 
<laughs> Jamie, while we're we're flicking through these slots, um, Jamie, can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you fine. No, that's that's just what I want. I'm conscious of people's time. I think lower cost no, no, structures. We've, we've, are... had a, we've had a question. We've had a question come in, Jamie, just while we're we're flicking through the pictures. Um, everything's always a compromise in in life. Um, what um, what would be your preference in terms of material uh, for buildings? Do you, would you go for steel concrete, which is easy to clean, or would you go for a wood, which is perhaps not as easy to clean and would harbour uh, bacteria? Um, <laughs> I've been pushing for more plastic. I wish I was on commission. Um, the amount of uh, plastic which is used by the thousands of cubic meter for pen fittings and everything in the pig industry across the Western world is huge. So we're seeing an, a slow increase in, in the use of plastics at pen level, which I think is a good idea. I would love it to go to timber. So whoever asked the question, I am with you all the way. The idea that you can't clean it is complete and utter old fashioned nonsense in the same way that um, you know, timber, timber frame housing was very slow to take off in Britain and especially England because there was a big fire about 400 years ago and the insurance industry wouldn't insure timber frame housing. Complete and utter nonsense. Um, I would go for timber. It's renewable. It's light. It can be impregnated. We use timber in laboratories. Um, my problem with timber is that, um, that there's such a weight of opinion against the idea you can't clean it. Um, you know, but you know, we've got laminates. Here's in this lower cross structure here. Um, that's a simple laminate on um, on plywood on the walls there. Um, you know, if that was being done on an provided on an industrial scale, you know, it wouldn't warp like the way it is. Um, but I, concrete and steel for calves is old hat. I know people are going to still do it because they want to drive heavy machinery at it badly, um, but it doesn't make sense in terms of you know, uh, um, a calf on milk, which is basically in this country an animal that needs high level of hygiene and less coldness about it. So these low cost structures, you know, there are a few around. Um, they do require steady maintenance, which of course, you know, when they don't get in this sort of you know, they, somebody sticks a fork through the, the plastic cladding and then it flies and rips off and then they blame the structure. And well, I'm sorry, this guy here done a stunning job with this thing. Um, I've had a go, but I've, I've given up you know, developing. We've developed a couple more, but um, the problem is the people that make these kind of structures, they make a lot more money selling to the soft fruit industry than selling half, you know, two or three to the farm, to the dairy sector. So, so just move on. Because we're, as I said, I'm not going to time. Don't know what's going on. What's going on? We've seen that before. That's the calf mono. So that's if you like a steel frame building designed for calves. I'll take the next picture. I think we could see more of these to answer you know the sort of broader broader question. Um, you sort of say, well, hang on, we can't get a big tractor in here. You go to Northern Europe, livestock, a lot of livestock farmers have small machinery to do this job. You could go in here with a skid steer and happily live 500 kilos, um, but we don't do that. We need to clean this building out with a huge, great tractor. It's a hindrance. It's the biggest problem I have in designing um, young stock housing is people that want to use big tractors to clean them out. But you can see here, you know, it's a very simple structure, low cost steel, timber on the edges. Um, it's got a fan and a duct because it needs ones anyway. You don't need a big steep roof because there's no stack effect to start with. Um, you know, a dry floor, a simple drain there. You can see a simple gully drain, um, you know, on the left hand side there. So, yeah, pretty simple, pretty reliable, um, quite a nice working environment. Move on. Same idea, simple drain down the bottom there. Basically, what it is, it's just a barrier. You, a simple barrier, um, quite nice working conditions. Move on again. 
it's a retrofit. Certainly the fan and the duct, James, is a really good way of making you know, older buildings work properly because at least you can say, I'm getting the fresh air in. Knock a few holes in the roof, I'll get the dirty air out as well. One question that we have had about that, Jamie, uh, that's come in, and I don't know if you can work it in as we're going through the photos, is is how do you clean the ventilation tube? Yeah, oh, great, great question. The first thing is, I mean, that one there is pretty disgusting. Um, so, first of all, um, I need to update, but there was a time there, 300 quid a pop for the tube, um, you know, and I would sort of say, well, you know, basically, you buy a new tube. Um, every so often. The value of buying one with a heavier fabric is they're designed to be cleaned. Um, and you know, you can imagine you the trouble with the very thin, the original sort of Proctor style ones is you know they don't take a lot of handling, in which case to me, you know, it's a consumable cost, um, is a very good question. But certainly the more robust fabrics are in tubes now. Um, certainly there's somebody working out of Cheshire. A well-known company, you're know, beginning with a capital G. You know, the, the materials they use. So basically, I would uh, to me is a summer job. Yeah, you take it out, you you wash it, stick it in a in a large um, you know, one of your polyprop barrels, let it soak, get the organic matter off, give it a rinse, stick it in a solution of paracetic acid, you know, a mild five percent solution, stick it back up again. Yeah, then we'll move on. <laughs> We're almost there. Temporary housing absolutely has, um, again, I've seen us doing this, You know, certainly in the face of an outbreak of pneumonia, where you sort of go clear out a cart shed, clear out the tractor shed, get the big bales out. There's an infrared heat lamp there on the left-hand side. You know, um, yeah. You're going to have to keep throwing straw at it on the floor, but basically fine enough. Designing to feed. Again, the feed system and how it works is such an important part of healthy calves um, that to me it's always an integral part of the design of the building. So automatic calf feeders, you want drainage very local to it because you know there's going to be a lot of liquid on the floor. You know you're going to want to have to maybe wash that floor maybe even two or three times a week if there's a bit of scour about. So there you go. I've got automatic feeders up on a concrete plinth surrounded by drains. And you go, well, there's a lot of money in that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of money in the feeders. Here we go again, you know, keeping stuff clean. It's got to be clean, milk's dirty stuff. You know, there's quite a lot of money tied up in that top right-hand corner, um, neck goats for calves. Um, but look at the control you have. You know, um, and in, in in terms of managing, you we we won't we'll never have enough labour to go running around groups of 15 cars. Um, but the payback on the cost of yokes um, is you really being able to manage your calves better. Um, and moving on, I think the whole bit of, uh, I'm repeating myself, so I've kind of done the job already. The calf kitchen, you should all be spending money on yourselves to make this job easier. And the next slide, you know, why the heck we can't have, you know how much hot water you need every morning at half past six. It could be there on tap, on a timer. Um, yeah, That's these things are money. Set up, JB. I, I think most people are quite jealous of that. But one another question, just referring back to the washing of, of calf buckets and equipment, is um, if, we, if we're washing them at, at 60 degrees, how long do they need to be at 60 degrees for? Right. If you get, can we go back one picture then? You know, and I sort of go, people would love that. I can you. I would almost come it the other way around. It's like, you, you know, if a farmer doesn't have a handling system for his cattle that works properly, wouldn't get a penny off me for anything. And I kind of go, you know, a kitchen that you, you probably get half the components for a kitchen. Down the local scrappies, you know, that sink there, that's 200 quid. Washing machine, well, I know I use washing machines on projects. I get them, I get them second hand from the Heart Foundation, you know, but pay full price, you know, 400 quid. What's that boiler cost? A couple of thousand quid? Now, 
all of a sudden, Jamie, I've spent what two, three, four, four, five, five grand. Yes, is that okay? Are you, are you there, James? You need to interact with me here. Sorry, yeah, it says, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going, okay, five grand a year, not a lot of moving parts. Yeah, that looks like 500 pounds a year for 10 years. Yep. Now you need car for water. For you know, and I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm talking one pound 50 a day. You will make it. This is coming out this winter. It's a present to the dairy industry from Jamie Robertson. I've done the maths because I am that kind of person that you 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 could not invest better on a dairy unit with calves than buying yourself a decent calf kitchen. Where one of these things, the un extraordinary bit where all the dirty water that comes out of that gray gray sink in the middle actually goes down a plastic pipe and down a drain as opposed to splattering all over the floor. You know, be nice to yourself. The answer to the question about the 60, um, I am not sure, but be very brief. But the thing about the cleaning actually is a bit like cleaning before disinfecting. You know, you, 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 you get, get rid of most of the muck first and you don't need that to be 60 degrees. I think to be fair again, that, and I don't know of any science here, I do know about cleaning and dirt and temperatures because the wonderful Jewel Thompson did that for us in the big industry, you know, but the point is, is that probably it might be better to say, you know, you have six days a week where we clean normally and on the seventh day or once a week, you do the deeper clean, you know, on the understanding that we can't get straight to perfection. It's a, it's a, it's a wiggly road, but I do think the calf kitchen is something, let's face it, Calf jackets barely existed, what, 10 years ago? Look at how much money people yeah. spend on feeding calves properly now. Never look back. And I think the calf kitchen's another one. But anyway, let's crack on. There's only a couple more. I'm sorry I've kept people. Well, here you go. <laughs> this, this is, hang on. I need to alter my screen here. So this will cause control. We'll see. So, Cost and value. So we're going down the left-hand side, basic A-frame and calf mono. Calf mono being a building that's designed right from start to um, house calves. And you start adding the cost of um, concrete bases. Down the bottom, or oh, sorry, oh, we've got the flexible structures, you basic mono pitch, a complete mono pitch. You know, where you've got the deal, it comes with the gate at the front and some feeders, basic hutches, deluxe hutches, it, group hutches, the igloo. Those prices are all not correct. I'm realizing that now. They keep moving. And the polytunnel down the bottom, that's an attempt to sort of say, well, you know, I've, I've done it, been involved in a few, but you know, if you put up a fairly hoop type structure and put some pens inside it, it's having a go, and the thing about them all is that they're all on a concrete base with drains. Because if you go over to the right-hand side, past you know whether we've got you pen sides, everything needs a pen side. You've got to keep the pens in. Um, if you go over to the right-hand side and see, well, we're trying to turn everything so over the two fixed structures. Total per 100 calves, that should be 80 calves. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this. But the point is, trying to turn things into a total per calf, right? This is getting it on the ground on a concrete base with drains. And the point of it is, is that, you know, there's obviously a variety. And if you've got, you know, the, every, every penny counts. But you can see that there are certain things whereby you know, the hutches are great in some ways, but they, per calf, they consume a lot more concrete. Um, you know, they've also got what I call a lot of dirty water runoff, and they don't have a cover and a veranda, whereas the igloo system that I've got in there, you know, it's um, for 15 calves, but 
that's a pretty significant pen feeding and roof system you have um, which is included in the overall price and contributes to the overall total per car so James it was just you having a go at sort of giving people an idea of um, you know what the relative costs might be and people argue okay I'll, I'll put up my own concrete you know I don't want a fancy wall you know it's basically trying to keep things in the fairly average average way of looking at everything um, I would suggest and James, if we need to amend any figures here we will be sending this presentation out to to everyone that's registered so we can just have a quick review of these figures and updates if needed before it it gets sent out to everybody yeah that that will be lovely I can see a couple of things there that, um, you are just a, a nibble that nibbled away at the thing is we can argue all night about these things but it's almost the same as you know how many square meters per car should there be um, if you look at these things and what's nice about the HDB you know, the, the the car design booklet you know, which is if you like behind tonight's talk is it talks the, the pros and cons of all these systems you know um, certain parts of Britain you, you really don't need a big steel frame building, um, you, you know, because the rain falls below 30 inches, but, you know, because you're in a part of the world where you use straws quite cheap, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you, you can take all the best hutches and igloos and everything you like. Um, if you stick them on a farm in Anglesey, um, they're soon going to end up in East Yorkshire. Um, and, and you won't have anything left. So there's an element of horses for courses. So I think we just just remember the value of all these things. And I think that should be us just about there, is it? I think there's just a couple more slides just to wrap up, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think there's tremendous potential. We just need to be very cautious of, if you like, the paying giving too much weight to cost and you say well that's all very well for you Mr Robertson I'm going hang on a minute you know, it's my job I've been doing this a long time um, and there's nothing wrong with low cost absolutely nothing at all I mean one of your questions earlier they're asking you know I've seen people make timber frame timber buildings work absolutely really well for calves so down the southwest cob board I think cob board's fantastic, but I'm not prepared to battle the veterinary profession, you know, on the ability to clean timber. You know, I'm, I get too tired of that kind of stuff. But I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, you know, what I like to see, and I've seen it across, you know, with hutches, with igloos, and with you know, a certain amount of the steel frame buildings, you know, being able to do this job sustainably, that's the best that really is, and it helps. It helps the people. The thing about the calf kitchen as well, it's really, it's really good at boosting people's, you know, enjoy, not in, well, yeah, enjoyment of their work, and 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 really the floors and the drainage and the cleaners cleaning is such an important aspect that um, you know, we're, we're, you get steady throughput. There's nothing better. Get sustainable outcomes. You know. The, the antibiotics, the, there's a list we can all read. You get get the losses and mortality you into the target areas that we want. And the great thing about it, some of the people we've worked with, is that you know they end up with stronger cows and with heifer calves to sell. And that's a really nice place to be. That's where we really want to go. You know, and, and of course this is this is it. This is where we're going. And the, the industry's done a brilliant job at realizing that actually you know all these calves are the they are the future. I know it's corny, but we we get it right at the beginning, and it pays us back. And then your know, environmental impact it ticks all the boxes, James. Every time, yes. what are we Ammonia, carbon footprint, antibiotic use, energy use. That's what we need. Uh, just conscious of time, so Tom, if you can yep. keep flicking off through the last two slides, yep. I think. There's the grants, the you know the, the the grant issues. The thing about it, if you want to grant, obey the rules. Um, you know, but I think you that I'm also coming out of this from the point of view you 
in the sort of in the other the other dirty world of science, um, you know, the data is quite clear on the impacts of hygiene, pen space quality, you know, bedding quality. And as I said, for me, actually, the hardest one, the hardest one is getting the drainage right. Which I'm very pleased that one of you, know, one or two people have come back and sort of queried that it is difficult because you know adult cows, you know, they produce a lot of liquid, which is pretty good at flushing down through channels and slats and drains. You know, the stuff out coming out of calf systems is sticky, sludgy stuff, and it's hard to move. But the target is James would design design for purpose, and and I must thank thank the people that have um help me in doing what I had to do and the folk in Northern Ireland, you know, and the folk in AFB, you know, in, in, in AHDB, I should say, James, who, who, you know, we've worked together a long time. It's all cool. Thank you for everything you've, you've put into the booklet as well, Jamie. It's, it is much appreciated. Um, I'd just like to, to finish off on, on one last question. Uh, Jamie, if that's okay, uh, I know that we've gone well over time, but we've had some really good questions and some some good discussion tonight. Um, it's it's all been really valuable. Um, but uh, one question's come in about using smoke bombs, and um, how quick how quickly would you like the smoke to disappear? Um, how you know can it disappear too quickly? Um, good ventilation versus a draft, perhaps. Jamie, what what are your thoughts on that? Smoke bombs, they're great in two ways and a nightmare in a third. So the first one is if they just disappear really quickly, you know, basically the smoke comes out the top of the, the pellet and then starts going sideways. Um, it's too it's too windy. Yeah. Yeah. If it hangs about, I, I think people tend to sort of say three to four minutes. You, you're looking at sort of clearance, um, doesn't mean it's all left the building, so we don't need to be pedantic about that. Um, you, we're, we're looking for you know, four to 10 air changes an hour. Well, that's, that's, a, you, you, that's, that's a lot more, where that, that sounds like sort of 15 minutes, but you can't see it properly. So broadly speaking, you, you three to four minutes. Then the last one is you, it, that you could use it sometimes and it's just pure confusing <laughs> it doesn't help at all but yeah they they're they're definitely good um much better than sort of seeing if you can measure ammonia or something like that which is expensive and needs a lot of interpretation so no smoke bonds fine good 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 um i will come back to you just in a, a short few seconds jamie just to get a, a take-home message from you tonight if there was one thing that you wanted people to go away with tonight, uh, what would that be? But just in the meantime, uh, for everybody that's listening, uh, there will be a follow-up email um, with the link to the recording of tonight's webinar and links to the um, resources and tools mentioned today, uh, specifically the Young Stock Housing Guide, which tonight's webinar has been focused around. Um, do keep a lookout on our social media platforms for any upcoming webinars that we've got um, on the screen. Uh, tonight, you can see that we've got more webinars in the pipeline uh, focusing on managing calf pneumonia. Uh, just register via the events page on the AHDB website, um, or I think on the next screen, we've got a QR code uh, which you can use uh, to register for the events. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. I hope you found it useful. Jamie, if I can just come back to you um, for your take home message from tonight, what would that be? Um, I think in terms of design, invest invest in the ability to do the job. You know, it, it certainly crept over me. We've done a brilliant job in the last 20 years on you know, getting better nutrition, keeping the calf warm, but I would say, yeah. So invest in doing the job, making the job easier, then it will be done better. Perfect. And there's been a lot of messages uh, commending you uh, for tonight's webinar with people uh, thanking you um, and, and that goes from, from us at HDB as well so thanks Jamie for tonight. Uh, wish everyone that's listening a good evening, um, hope that you enjoy the rest of the pneumonia series uh, throughout November and thanks very much for attending tonight, thank you very much.
Grant, thank you all very much and for the organisation. I appreciate it.